All right, well, I think uh, both of your presentations um, kind of lead right into my presentation. I uh, work for the Ohio Department of Agriculture and uh, since uh, mid-2019 have been working on uh, our H2 Ohio program. Uh, H2 Ohio program uh, was launched in 2019 by our governor, Mike DeWine, uh, as a comprehensive uh, water quality initiative uh, in the entire state of Ohio, but primarily for, for our Department of Ag in the, the western basin of Lake Erie, uh, which we affectionately call the WLAB, uh, to address phosphorus runoff uh, from farm fertilizer. But uh, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the Ohio EPA are also partners in this, and they're working on uh, other issues of drinking water, wastewater, uh, home septic, et cetera. So this really is a multi-agency um, faceted approach that we are taking in Ohio. Um, for our part, we are uh, working uh, primarily in cropland agriculture, and we are looking to uh, focus on three areas. We're looking at nutrients, we're looking at erosion, and we're looking at water management. And uh, we have a comprehensive seven uh, practices that we are offering. Uh, the governor initially brought up in his presentations and in the program, we have 10 total practices. Uh, the Department of Ag and our partners in the soil and water conservation districts are working on the first seven of those practices. So um, we found out very quickly that uh, there are a significant number of producers who, while many are taking soil sam samples and, and maybe using them to some extent, there was really kind of a disconnect between uh, the soil test and an actual nutrient management plan. So we decided that that was gonna be kind of the, the keystone of our program. And we were going to require anyone that wants to participate in H2 Ohio to have a, a nutrient management plan. Uh, Ohio Revised Code does spell out what a voluntary nutrient management plan is. And uh, so our practice has to meet that as a minimum. Uh, if, uh, a per, if a participant is a livestock producer and has a significant amount of manure that they're producing, uh, they are required to have a CNMP to participate in our program and to follow all uh, tri-state fertilizer recommendations and uh, NRCS 590 standards. So, so to start with, we ask everybody to make sure they had current soil test, and then they or their for our certified dealer helping them would deliver a nutrient management plan to the soil and water conservation district for their board approval, uh, which is also within uh, our code, or uh, a director's designee from the Department of Agriculture can also make those approvals from the 4R certified dealers. So um, the purpose of this is really to get producers to sit down with their, their dealer, also sit down with the Soil and Water Conservation District, review what nutrients are needed in field by field case and where those nutrients are gonna come from uh, and just kind of do a, a mass balance of nutrient use uh, throughout the, the length of our program. And we think that's been fairly successful um, as our first practice. Once the nutrient management plan is completed, then we start allowing them to layer on and somehow I jumped. Um, we have other practices for some reason, they're not showing up on my slides. So I'm just gonna talk about them very briefly. We have a VRT practice, which is variable rate um, phosphorus placement. And that practice, the producer gets paid whether they apply phosphorus on an acre or not, if it's not called for. So we're paying them for the whole acres where they're using uh, variable rate phosphorus. The second practice is subsurface placement of phosphorus. And uh, as Marin pointed out, uh, we see a lot less uh, movement of phosphorus uh, through both surface and tile when it is placed properly below the surface. And so for commercial fertilizer, we're allowing producers to place that phosphorus um, where needed uh, with our, our, with our um, VNMPs and our CNMPs uh, for our program, uh, no phosphorus applications are allowed for participants if the soil test P value is greater than 50 parts per million Bray P1. So we know that in Ohio with uh, manure, they can apply uh, removal rates of manure uh, at soil test levels higher than that, but we wanted to go a little bit higher. So on our manure applications, we're also limiting that to 50 parts per million. So our fourth practice, our manure incorporation practice is um, not just an incorporation practice, but one of the other things we have found is that um, we do have a significant in some parts of our watershed and, and the watershed that we're talking about, the Western Lake Erie Basin in Ohio component, it does also go a little bit into Indiana and 
Michigan, but the Ohio component of it is about one or 2.4 million acres total. So of that, about 20% gets uh, for manure. Uh, that's how much manure we produce. So we, we do have a deficit in our watershed. So we do um, bring in a significant amount of commercial phosphorus. Uh, but what we want to see is on those fields where the producers have for many years been applying uh, manure and they have uh, higher levels of phosphorus, uh, this practice will allow them and the payment rates, the cost share payments will allow them to move that phosphorus farther from the home farms onto fields where they're currently using commercial phosphorus and thereby reducing the total amount of phosphorus being used in the watershed. And this just over provides an overall better use of manure. Uh, also, I think as Marin mentioned, uh, small grains can have play a significant role in when a producer can apply uh, manure or commercial phosphorus. So we're also in encouraging producers to reutilize small grains in their rotation. So we're applying um, a payment to this practice. Uh, in order to participate in the small grains practice, not only do they have to plant and harvest the small grain, they also have to, um, if they apply manure, they have to apply that manure uh, between after the harvest of the small grain and uh, before October 15th. And then they either have to establish a cover crop or a double crop following that manure application uh, so that there is uh, green growth after that throughout the rest of the year. And they have to maintain at least the stubble if they do a double crop uh, through the winter. They can't, um, they have to plant an overwintering cover crop or at least leave the stubble for that crop throughout the winter. We also, uh, along with that, we didn't want to uh, forget about forages. So we are uh, encouraging the reintroduction of, of commercial forages uh, back into the watershed. Uh, this is a practice that they have to maintain for at least two years. They can maintain it for all three years of the program if they choose. Uh, they can uh, do subsurface placements of fertilizer on their uh, forages where they are needed. Uh, we also have cover crops uh, in our program. The cover crops have to be, however, have to have an overwintering component. They cannot plant simply a, a cover crop that's gonna be winter killed. We want them to have at least 50% of the cover crop species um, by seeding rate uh, be overwintering species and they have to maintain that cover crop at least until March 15th of the previous year. And uh, our standard uh, date, we also have moved up the date in which the cover crops need to be established by to October 15th, even for cover crops such as cereal rye, which potentially can be planted um, after that date. But we wanna see fall growth in those cover crops. So they begin to utilize those nutrients, start storing those nutrients uh, and being able to uh, have better, better survivability through the winter as well. Uh, our last practice that we're working with is uh, drainage water management. And essentially this is uh, ins installing uh, water management structures uh, on tiles and near the edge of the field, so wherever the producer needs it. They, we do have acreage minimums in these, uh, but essentially this is to reduce uh, the nutrient offload uh, at time at, during the winter and other times of the year. The producers can also manage it in the summer for, um, for water maintenance. And, um, and we've out found success with this practice in the past uh, with our livestock producers applying them um, at the edge of fields where they're gonna be applying manure and using it as a safety check to make sure that manure is not moving off the field. Through previous federal programs, we've installed about 1,500 to 2,000 of these structures in the 24 county area. Uh, so we don't see a significant number of new structures going in, but we did want to encourage additional use of this practice as well. We started the program uh, initially in 2020 in the 14 western counties uh, of the Western Basin, and they're the counties that you can see highlighted here. Uh, we had an extensive rollout package. We had eight meetings in the, the, the basin. We had over 2,000 producers uh, and we, uh, at those meetings, and we had over 2,000 applications that were received. Um, and 1.2 million acres uh, in just the voluntary nutrient management plan. That's the practice that we can really gauge how, how widespread our participation is. It does not include anyone in, in, uh, who is required to have a nutrient management plan already. So any of our CAFOs who are permitted and are required to have a nutrient management plan could not enroll in this practice or in the VNMP implementation practice. Uh, they can enroll in all of our other practices though. So we had that sign up, it amounted to about 43% of our acres and they were signing up at that point for a four year um, contract. 
uh, at the, just at the close of our signup period was when the, the COVID pandemic hit and kind of everything got shut down and we were in a little bit of limbo and weren't sure even if our funding was still gonna be there when we kind of came out of the other side. Uh, fortunately uh, for um, Ohio and for our, our participants, we, we were, we did have to make some minor modifications. We went from a four-year agreement to a three-year agreement and um, we still maintained over 1800 of our producers and as of uh, last Friday, we have uh, 1,500 almost VNMPs that have been fully developed and approved by their soil and water conservation district, which amounts to nearly 900,000 acres in that original 14 counties. And they have uh, implemented and we're finishing up the first year of practices. Uh, most of those practices will be verified through the, the uh, coming fall and winter. And uh, next summer, we'll have a, an idea of a full year's worth of our practices in those original 14 counties. This summer, we were able to expand um, our program to the remaining 10 counties. Uh, the, the 14 counties essentially all make up the Maumee watershed, and that's the watershed that uh, drains directly through uh, Toledo and, and uh, was, was uh, viewed as by many as to be one of the contributing causes for the, 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 the uh, water quality issues that they had uh, with the water plant in Toledo. Uh, in this summer, in July, we launched in the remaining 10 counties, which is primarily the Sandusky River watershed. Um, we did, we do allow producers uh, in the entire counties to sign up. We've had many practices in other year, other programs where they sign up specifically by watershed boundaries. It can become very difficult to manage breaking watershed, breaking fields. Um, so we decided that we were going to operate on a county-wide basis. So any county that's even a part, a little part of the Western Lake Erie Basin uh, is able to enroll in our program. So the other thing we learned from our first sign up was we were allowing producers to sign up all seven practices at the same time. So we had a lot of folks that were signing up and trying to implement um, placement and manure incorporation practices before they had developed their nutrient management plan. So uh, for our second 10 counties, we split the sign up into two phases and the first sign up, which we just completed uh, October 15th, uh, they were signing up for the VNP development, the small grain uh, conservation crop rotation and the overwintering cover crops. And uh, as you can see, we signed up in an additional 600,000 acres uh, out of about 800 producers and uh, we signed up uh, significantly more cover crops than we thought we would probably sign up. So the, that 10 counties, we will have a second sign up, a phase two sign up next spring once they've submitted and approved their nutrient management plan, which will allow them to sign up for three years of practices through 2025. Um, so far from just the state funding, we have received $150 million in H2 Ohio funding for uh, these 24 counties that add in a significantly uh, uh, Funding for previous programs uh, that we've had in these counties, we're pretty closing on about $200 million of state funds that we've been able to offer these counties since about 2017. Uh, we have about 1.6 million acres, which as I mentioned, the, the, the whole watershed as a whole is about uh, 4 million acres. So it's about right, a, right at 40% of the watershed involved. And we've signed up significant portions of the watershed in uh, each and every practice. Obviously, our future, we've got funding for this, this watershed in, through 2025. However, as I mentioned, H2 Ohio is a statewide program. Uh, we have uh, other uh, avenues. We are also have just hired uh, regional watershed coordinators who will be uh, helping our division develop strategies for what practices will fit best in other parts of Ohio. Ohio is a unique state in that we uh, we go from the lake bed soils uh, in northwest Ohio, where I'm at, and down into uh, Appalachian um, foothills uh, in the southeast section where there's very little row crop agriculture. So the, the needs are going to be different uh, in each region of our state. But we do intend to um, have H2 Ohio be a statewide program as we go into the future. Another interesting component of our program is our partnership, not only with the local soil and water conservation districts, uh, but in Ohio, we recently had it incorporated into our revised code that we would have a voluntary certification program for, for farmers and agricultural producers. Uh, we decided uh, fairly quickly that, that um, having that handled by a, a non-governmental non third party would be uh, beneficial for getting producers to sign on board. So. Um, 
uh, several of the non, the all of the agricultural commodity groups, as well as some environmental groups like the Environmental Defense and Nature Conservancy, um, as well as some of our leading universities who are doing research in into water quality issues, are all a part of this uh, Ohio Agricultural Conservation Initiative, and they have developed a voluntary conservation certification program, which they have begun implementing uh, last year as well, and uh, are continuing to implement that uh, at this stage. Uh, the tie-in between H2 Ohio and the, the OACI certification is simply that a producer has to be registered and, and enters their farm information into the system and, and receives a essentially a score from OACI. Uh, they do not have, there's no passing score from our perspective because we want all of the producers, even especially some of those that may be at the lower end of that score who have a lot of room to grow, we want to encourage them to participate in our program as well. So that has uh, been a very short synopsis is our what Ohio is doing through our H2 Ohio program to help uh, implement a best management practice on our, on our agricultural lands. 